Good afternoon. Did everybody get enough cookies and lemonade? Yeah, it's like being at Sunday school or Bible school. Okay. Um, my name is Dwayne Carver with Hall Planning and Engineering. I'm glad to um, welcome you this afternoon to our session, Beyond Bike Lanes, Building a Culture of Bicycle Safety. Before you turn the lights off, I have some important information I need to read to you for those of you who are in AIA or AICP. Um, this session is good for one and a quarter, 1.25, for those of you who speak decimal. Um, AIA or AICP credits, your choice. Uh, for the AIA, you need to have, you need to uh, sign in at the back of the room. Mike has got the sign-in forms. There's Mike in the back of the room. Uh, and make sure you write your name and your AI, AIA number clearly on there. For AICP, you probably also already know that you need to self-report this on the uh, APA website. Um, the event number is number, get a pencil, 19209, and that will give you a list of all the sessions and tours from CNU20 uh, so you can self-report those credits. Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Thank you for uh, coming out on the last session, on the last day. Everybody's tired, but you're here. We're going to try not to have you guys fall asleep. Uh, the, the, the session today, this is really the third of a... Oh, that's no good. There we go. Screw that in there. The third of what's been a sort of three-part sequence, as you guys have known, if you've got any other safety things, we're in one of the most dangerous regions for peds uh, and bikes. Uh, on Wednesday, we did a 202 that looked at the state of the practice in traffic safety. On Thursday, and I hope you guys had a chance to catch this, when we had Peter Norton talk about how the automobile took over the street. Uh, and this is sort of, and that was a historical look back, this is intended to look forward. So where do we go from here? What does the future of safety look like? We've been in this this passive safety crashworthy paradigm where we're trying to protect the driver um, from his own or her own irresponsibility. The future seems to be to demand more responsibility from folks and to make people empowered um, to use the transportation system in a more multimodal uh, and safe way. So this is the, what we want to do here is talk about how cycling, which is really at the forefront of this movement, um, has been leading this. And I want to start with sort of the state of the practice with with what we see with the bike stuff. So typically you'll see when people present on bikes things like this. Wow, look at how great Portland is. Yep. Right? They build all these facilities and they've got all this biking. Right? And look at all the great stuff they have. They have cycle tracks, right, where they put the parked cars outside of the bikeway so you don't have the doing problem. We've got the bike boxes that bring the bikes up to the front so they can lead before traffic. And then we've got the bike boulevards. And this is really cool, right? We're taking lanes from cars and we're providing it to bikes. And the conclusion is always, right, if you build it, they will come, right, the field of dreams conclusion. And what I want to suggest to you is we need to get out of that mindset, right? That's a very simplistic mindset. Facilities don't just happen. They happen because people demand them. They happen because there's a culture of folks that are demanding new facilities. And really the forefront of the bicycle movement right now is not the people who are saying, let's strike these miserable three-foot lanes on the edge of the roadway, and you can go see those on Okeechobee Boulevard, right? The future are the people that are out there physically reclaiming the street from the cars, right? In the forefront of this are the critical mass folks. You all know who they are? Yeah. Critical mass are the folks that say, we're going to take back the street. We're going to come out in large numbers, and we're going to reclaim our right to use the right-of-way. And they do things like corking where they have people come and block conflicting traffic so the bicyclists can go through. They're demanding their right to use the street. They're demanding equal participation for public facilities. Now, it's a protest movement. It's a social protest movement, and as often happens, it leads to arrests. So people protest the streets, drivers complain, and the cops come out in force and arrest them. Not always. Sometimes you have good police. But it's often a police problem because it's a demand for rights that have been taken from us and given to the automobile. It's the demand to get them back. And it causes trouble with the powers that be. But not all of this stuff has to be confrontational. Once you get people biking, they realize, hey, this is kind of fun. Right? This is, why don't we get together and have fun rides? So you see things like Portland's Bunny Ride. Or in Miami, we have costume rides where we all go out, we put on our best costumes, and we ride our bikes around the community. How fun is that? Right? Or another thing going on in Portland. What would happen if we just moved our house from one place to another via bike? People come out en masse, load up their, their home furnishings on bicycles and ride them to the new place. Let's make an event out of it. It's becoming not just a means of transportation, it's a social movement. 
right? Or Petal Palooza. And they're in how many years have they been doing this now, Marcy? In Portland. Let's have a whole festival, a summer festival devoted to the greatness of the bicycle, right? It's a countercultural movement, right? So festivals, different fun rides, different activities, different races, all associated with the bicycle and all encouraging greater bicycle use. And once you start building this culture, you realize that you don't have to stick it to the man. That in fact, you can start becoming more, it becomes an educational, a more forgiving or diffuse or forgiving environment. So this is often common with folks who ride regularly. Rather than try to, to fight the car, let's use it as an educational tool. If you're honking at us, let's treat that as a friendly endeavor. Honk if you like bikes. Hold up your sign when the aggressive motorist honks at you. Or wave at them. You're going to see more and more of this. Let's not be aggressive at all. Let's be friendly because that's what cycling is in large part about. There's a social aspect to it as part of a movement. Um, and after a while, when you build up this bicycle culture, you build up this body of users, you no longer need critical mass at all. You go into Portland has the shift website, which lists all the bicycling events around the region. Critical mass isn't there anymore. There's no need for it. There's such a diverse body of users doing all kinds of different cycling events that you don't need to fight the battles anymore. The culture exists. And it's that culture that demands the infrastructure. When you have the culture in place, they demand it from the elected officials, which then do things like put in bike boxes. Portland now, and they've got an 8% bike mode shift split for commuters, commute trips. 8%, which is pretty phenomenal. I found out the other day it's something like 10%, an additional 10% use bikes at least part of the time for their commute. So you're looking at 18% of commuters in Portland now using cyclists, cyclists for at least some portion of their trip. And that's really, really cool. To the point where you talk to folks from Portland, they say, actually, our problem is it's just as miserable to bike as it is to drive because there's so much bike congestion. Right? That re requires, results in more demand for facilities. Right? But the other thing they do is they're not just striping these bike lanes. And again, I encourage you to go down Okeechobee and see how bad these bike lanes are. Well, don't ride them. Just look at them and point at them. Um, but they also go forward and they look at what the different types of users there are. So they're the hardcore, and you know these, they're the spandex cyclists, right? The people with the helmets and the gear, and they're out there, and they're going to bike in any condition whatsoever, because that's who they are. And they're going to go 25 miles an hour, right? The, the, the road cyclists, that's one group. But then you've got another group that Portland has been very good at tapping into, too, which is the enthused and confident cyclists, people who will ride if they at least feel marginally safe about it. And then there's the rest of us, right? There's the rest of us that are interested in cycling, but we're concerned. We're worried about the possible risk of death and injury associated with cycling. If we can target those users, we can increase the pool of, pool of cyclists. And that doesn't come just from facilities. It comes from other programs that try to reach out and broaden the base of cyclists. So if you look at a survey of who rides bikes, it's almost predominantly male. And typically males, young males under 30, that tend to do this. Females are a proportionately small amount of the number of people cycling. So you can have outreach to them. Programs like Girl Bike Love um, talk about the different ways you can assert your femininity with the cycle, right? And things like how you repair your bike, which I actually found illuminating because I'm not particularly good at bike repair, right? But how you do that. Let's familiarize women with bicycles so that they can be part of this culture because it's a user base we can tap into to grow the body of cyclists. Or you can have special rides that are associated with, with women. So the Cyclofem uh, bike ride. Let's make it a feminine endeavor and then reach out to that population to get them involved. Another population that's been very hard to get. It used to be when I was a kid, people cycled and then they stopped. And I would be frightened if my daughter tried to cycle. Terribly frightened because it's very dangerous. So how do we encourage cycling for youth? Well, one way to do it is to introduce social programs that make it safe. So the bicycle train, to cycle to school, you've got a, an engineer and a caboose, and then the children in between, and they ensure that the children can get to school safely. So we're now reaching out to another body of users, right? These are all the future cyclists of tomorrow. Get them early, get them acquainted with safe cycling, and then you have an, a dedicated body of, of cyclists later. So what I want to sort of wrap up with is it's not just stripe the lane. There is, those of us who do safety work realize that there are five E's of safety. The first is engineering. You provide the infrastructure and the facilities, and that's fine. Right? That's what we tend to focus on. But there's a host of other things we need to do. We need education about safe cycling. Most cyclists casually don't understand how to ride safely, and Carrie's going to talk a little bit about how to do that. The knowledge is essential. It's not just change the driver. The cyclists need to understand the behaviors and norms that are, that are safe as well. Enforcement. 
police out there understanding what the law is and what it isn't. A lot of the harassment of cyclists comes from the ignorance of police officers about the law regarding cyclists. Um, so encouraging law enforcement folks to both understand the law and enforce the law appropriately is another tool to encourage safe cycling. This one I actually think is the most important of the five, which is encouragement, which lets identify the body of users who are potential cyclists and understand the barriers to cycling so that we can then address them. Portland has the level of ridership that it has for cyclists because they're involved in encouragement. And the bicycle movement's doing it already. And the key thing for the new urbanists is how can we tap into this movement? We're very excited about things like tactical urbanism that reclaims space. The cycling movement's doing that too. Let's take advantage of that energy to reclaim the street from the automobile. And then finally, and maybe as an academic I should conclude that this is the most important, which is evaluation. Right? After you implement these programs, let's study their effectiveness. Right? And you do that by funding academics to conduct research studies uh, with conclusions that report how great your programs are. Um, so those are the five E's of safety. We focused too long within the new urbanism solely on one and ignored the others, which I would argue to you are really driving the movement and they're really reclaiming the space from the automobile. Um, and then just to conclude, and this will segue uh, to Wes, is we build this body of ridership. As it goes up, you see traffic-related injuries and deaths go down. So as the number of cyclists uh, and pedestrians on the street go up, everyone becomes safer. It's not just the cyclists and the peds. Everyone becomes safer. And that's a profound point. When we begin reclaiming the street from the automobile, we get safer environments. When we get more urban environments, and we get more humane environments. I mean, with that, I want to segue to Wes to have him talk about why this is the case. And then following me, the Carrie Caffrey will talk. She runs Cycle Savvy, is going to talk about bicycle education, the advocacy programs that she works on. And it's going to be a really exciting presentation. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Give me one sec to find this. All right, hello, I'm Wes Marshall. I'm an assistant professor of civil engineering at University of Colorado Denver. And I'm gonna start right where, where Eric left off and talk about um, safety and safety in numbers. And um, you know, first off, when we look at cities that have, that have high biking, um, we often think of these places as, as the most vibrant cities and the places that, that people wanna be. It's not just the place that's good for bicyclists. Um, but, I mean, the problem that a lot of people have in becoming into one of those top tier groups that Portland's looking at is getting past the idea that bicycling is not a safe activity. Um, and part of the reason is in most places it's not. Um, it really is less safe and it's difficult to bike and the numbers tend to bear that out that your fatalities per mile um, are much higher as a bicyclist. Um, but when we start looking at, at the places that have a lot of bicycling. They're safer, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm going to go through through some of those today. Um, so conventional wisdom says that the more one does something, the more risk you have. Um, so when we look at places that have high biking, just like Eric started to allude to, they actually have an opposite effect. There's a paradox here where places like Copenhagen, when they have higher bike flows, they tend to see safer per cyclist in terms of what the outcomes actually are. And the numbers that you're seeing in most of these places is once you get to about 50 bikers per hour, that's when the safety increases for each biker. So that's the sort of safety in numbers idea. And that's where we're gonna start, is looking at safety just for the cyclists, and then we're gonna move into to other folks. So this is a study from uh, Lars Ekman in Sweden. And you see the same thing. I mean, looking at the total distance bicycle than Copenhagen, here's the the rate of seriously injured bikers. So you see it for about 10 years there that it's been going down and down as they've getting more bicycling. And it's not just the case in Europe, it's also been the case like Eric was talking about in places like Portland. Um, and here's a pretty rough estimate of the bike levels in a place like Portland. So this is the bridge bicycle traffic and this is their bicycle crash rate. So as their number of bicyclists goes up, their crash rate's going down. And, you know, Eric showed these slides exactly, so I'll go over this quickly, but um, Jacobson looked at this in 14 different countries and showing, you know, again, the same thing. We're seeing that the more bicycling we're having, the better we're seeing for safety. Um, similar for places in the United States. More bicycling and walking, we're getting 
better safety. And it goes on and on. So I was doing a study in Boulder, Colorado. And this is really one of the few places in the United States that has that 50 bicyclists per hour limit. We're, we're seeing the same type thing where we're getting better crash numbers as, as we go further and further. So, you know, safety numbers, it's an important part of it. But it's not the only thing. Um, you know, in Jacobson's paper, he, he talks about the fact that it's the reason we're seeing this is that drivers are becoming more aware. So it's not really that the bicyclists themselves are safer, but it's the way that drivers are responding to the cyclists. So it's more of an awareness in numbers. And you see this in some of the some of the reports that have done case studies of places all over the world. But that's still not enough. There's still more happening here. There's other things that are changing the dynamics of these places that are making it safer. So, you know, we see this thing. More bikes, we get increased driver awareness. That's good. But a lot of people argue that, well, really, why are we having more bikes in the first place is because we're building a safer environment. So it's not that the bikes are creating more safety. Well, maybe it's the opposite way around, the whole chicken and egg syndrome, maybe the better infrastructure. But again, what else is there? I mean, Eric was alluding to the culture, and I think that's a big part of what we're seeing. And when you start looking more and more at the numbers, is that we're not just bettering safety for the bicyclists. These places are safer for everybody. They're safer for drivers. They're safer for people walking around. So you look at Portland's numbers, and like Eric said, they're up to 8% now. But between 1990 and 2000, they went from 1.2% bike mode share to 58 During those same years, they were averaging 60 fatal crashes per year in the 90s, and then fewer than 35 in the 2000s. And you know, the last numbers I saw, they were down to around 20 fatal crashes per year. And as you said, the bike rate has gone up and up. The Netherlands, you know, really known for its biking. They have around 27% biking mode share. It's one of the safest countries in the world. But you know, we were just saying that the more bicycling you have, bicycling, it's inherently unsafe compared to driving, you would think. So why are these places that have more of something that's less safe than driving better overall? And that, that was a big question that led to some of this work we were doing. Um, so I did a lot of research looking at California cities, um, and one of these cities was Davis, California. Davis, the highest bike mode share in the United States, 14%, is even a little bit higher now, but their f road fatality rate was 2.1 fatalities per 100,000 people that live there. So that's lower than the Netherlands, which is around three or four fatalities per 100,000 population. Those aren't just for bicyclists, that's overall. So that's looking at road safety more like a health impact. So it doesn't matter how much you drive or how much you bike, it's more, you know, what's your chances of, of dying in the roads? Because as you know, dying on the roads is probably bad for your health. So looking at Davis, we looked at 10 years of crash data. Um, there were 14 fatal crashes, but 10 of them were on the limited access highways. Only four crashes happened on the real street network. So there were two bike fatalities, one pedestrian fatality, and one car fatality there over 10 years. And we, there's been research looking at transit-based cities. You know, we think, oh, of course, transit's safer than driving. So if we have a transit-based city, then guess what? We're probably going to have a, a safer overall city. At the same time, we wouldn't think that might happen for bicycling, because like we said, bicycling is less safe than driving. If we have a bicycling-based city, it should be a less safe city overall. Then why are we seeing these, these trends telling us the exact opposite thing? So if you look at some of the numbers, they do say that bicycling you know, is 10 times more dangerous on a per mile basis than driving. And this is a study from a few folks that's been sort of well distributed. And you know, what you, when you look at these numbers, it's not considering the fact that drivers are taking longer trips for the most part, that there's situations like we're talking about with the safety in numbers. And that there's something else. There's another dynamic here is that these bikers have an overall effect on the dynamic of the road. They have an overall effect on the culture of a city. And I think that is what we're missing. So maybe overall bicycling is less safe than driving, but in some cities where people are doing this right, it's safer. And it's helping create safety for more than just the bicyclists. So here's just a quick picture. And you feel, if, if you're a driver behind this group of bicyclists, you, you would drive one way. But, you know, as the bicyclists start to disappear, the road starts to feel very different. So there is a 
change in the effect here. Here's a picture from University of Connecticut where I got my PhD, and here's a road that was considered unsafe, right? Um, a lot of problems they thought they were having, so what they do to try to fix this? They remove the on-street parking, trying to make it safer. You know, six months later, a girl was actually killed late one night there, and what they did is they started adding big yellow signs everywhere in, in crosswalks, and that's how they tried to improve safety. So um, back when I did some parking research, we were looking at on-street parking, and people, there's a lot of detractors to it saying that it creates a less safe environment. Um, and we did find that there are more crashes per mile with on-street parking, you know, 7%. But if you look at the fatal and severe crashes, there's almost a third fewer of those type crashes on a per mile rate. And the chance of it being a fatal or severe crash, when a crash does happen, much lower. So we're giving up a few fender benders for saving lives. And that's what I think we're getting a similar type situation when we're talking about places that have, that have high biking. And why couldn't bikers change the dynamics of the road? Why couldn't having this, it doesn't even necessarily even have to be the infrastructure. It's like Eric was saying, part of it is the culture, part of it is the dynamics of what's changing here. You know, so you look at this intersection from, from Boulder, Colorado, as a driver approaching this with no bikes in front of you, you might do one thing. Here's an example of a car, you know, there's a red light there, it's pulling up beyond the white line. They're doing something, they're reacting to the situation that's in front of them. Again, if you're a driver pulling into this situation, where you have three bikers there waiting, you have to approach this intersection much differently. These bikers, not the infrastructure, have changed the dynamics of how this place works. And that is what is, I think, giving us a better safety impact. Um, so looking back at the, uh, the study of the California cities, we had about 24 cities that we were looking at. We had 12 of the safest cities we could find, medium-sized cities, and 12 of the least safe cities. They were all similar in a lot of things, but your chances of dying in the least safe cities were over three times more than in the safer cities. Um, and interestingly, the safer cities had much less driving a lot more transit, a lot more walking, a lot more biking. And we started to break down our safer cities into three groups. So we had a highest bicycling city, set of cities with places like Berkeley and Davis. We had medium bicycling cities and lower bicycling cities. Now looking at the mode share, you have bicycling mode share in the green, pedestrian mode share, transit mode share, and on the far right you see the U.S. average there. So the low bicycling cities that were safe tended to be along the same lines of the U.S. average. The less safe cities, you know, a little bit less in terms of transit, but otherwise not too far off. But then we had these two groups of cities, high and medium bicycling, that were really safe, despite the fact there was a lot of bicycling, which we think is inherently unsafe. Um, looking a little bit close, more closely at a few of these places, so Santa Barbara is one of the medium bicycling cities that was safer. Um, and over the 10 years, we saw two bike fatalities, 16 pedestrian fatalities, and 19 vehicle fatalities in that city. And what I tried to do is come up with just a simple proxy measure for how many people were actually participating in these different types of modes there. So just based on percent mode share um, by the population of the place, here's approximately the number of people that I thought were doing these type of modes, so bikers, pedestrians, drivers. And this is just for looking at some big trends here, so come up with vehicle fatality rates, pedestrian fatality rates, bike fatality rates, based upon those proxies for how much is happening here. Um, and we see we have a pretty low vehicle fatality rate, pedestrian fatality rate a little bit higher, and the bike fatality rate, this is per 100,000 of those type of users. Looking at one of the less safe cities is Rialto, California. One bike fatality, 39 pedestrian fatalities. So they had fewer bike fatalities, they had a lot more pedestrian fatalities, and quite a few more vehicle fatalities. But you look at the, the proxy for how many people were biking, they only had about 180 bikers there, compared to over 3,000 in Santa Barbara. So even though there's only one bike fatality, it's clearly a much more dangerous place to be out biking. So using those same way to look at this, you see a, a higher vehicle fatality, much higher pedestrian fatality rate, and even a much higher bike fatality rate. So looking at those rates for all the cities combined, we see similar things. So you see the less safe cities, clearly more dangerous in terms of vehicle, and these are just for fatal and severe injury rates. And our, all our safe cities pretty similar. We start looking at pedestrian fatality and severe injury rates. Um, we start to see some differences within the, the safer cities on the left there. Um, so the lower bicycling cities, a little bit more dangerous for a pedestrian. And it gets even more dangerous when you start getting to a bicyclist. 
I mean, you look at the less safe cities, that goes off the charts. I mean, it was, if I tried to put it all in one graph, you couldn't even see that, that bar. You need uh, Al Gore and his lift to bring you up to the top. So when you start looking at the infrastructure that we're building, um, a lot of these things isn't that different. Um, you see on the top there is some of the street network type variables, the common ones, intersection density, which is a measure of street network density. Link to node ratio is more of a measure of street connectivity. Um, the big difference there is probably the intersection density between the less safe cities and the safer cities. Looking at what the major streets are like, when there's sidewalks, the percentage of major streets that have sidewalks, percentage of major streets that have bike lanes. You know, it's not like the places with high biking have more bike lanes than the places with low biking. That's not the difference. There's something else happening here, and part of it goes back to that culture idea. So, you know, looking at the big differences, I think, you know, the intersection density is probably the biggest difference between the safe and the unsafe. In terms of where there's bicycling or no less bicycling, that the average number of lanes on your major roads is probably one of the bigger ones we're seeing. So quickly going through some of those quick graphs we put together. Um, so here's a chance of a vehicle fatality on the left, on the y-axis, and your intersection density on the x-axis. So the denser the street network, the better there is for safety for vehicles. Same goes for pedestrians. Same goes for bicyclists. Across the board, um, the denser the network, it seemed to be one of those, the strongest corollaries with what we were seeing. Um, so going back to the, to the bigger point is part of it is what we're saying here is if you start improving the infrastructure, you're going to lead to more biking and maybe that, that simple thing that Eric was talking about that we shouldn't be looking at, but that's what I'm saying as well, that it's more than that. Um, it starts to influence how many bikers we have and that starts to influence what the streets and the na dynamics of the streets are like, and that starts to influence the culture. And it's bringing all these things together is where we're getting safer places for everybody. And these high bicycling cities have a much, you have a much less, f smaller chance of dying on the roads in these types of places. And that's an important thing. And that's what we should be selling in terms of trying to get people to change their mindset in terms of building places that have better biking and building places that have traffic calming and that's all these trends come together and you can attract bicyclists you can therefore make the street safer and it's a cyclical thing so it's not one leads to the other they all reinforce each other and that last piece that culture piece is a part of it you know think of the places i've been looking at boulder and davis and berkeley these all have a very strong bicycling culture portland the netherlands so it all integrates together into creating probably the safest type cities we are seeing in the world. Thank you very much. And next, well, our next speaker is Carrie Caffrey from Cycle Savvy. Um, and she runs a fantastic program, and she's going to tell us uh, a little bit about that here. But while she gets set up, is there one question? Does anybody have one question for Wes? During the segue? Or Eric? Or me? No? Speechless? One. Okay. A lot of the places you mentioned are college towns. Um, is there anything about that particular culture that may affect? I, th I think that um, <clears throat> that's sort of been some of the incubators of where this culture is beginning in a lot of the college towns. So um, some of the other cities that did have high bicycling weren't um, as strong a college towns like Boulder and Davis and Berkeley. But um, that's part of it. I mean, Portland has colleges there, but that is a, much, is a bigger city, so that's not a college town per se. Um, it, it's a part of it, and that's, I think, what helps add to, to some of these um, the cultural side of the issues. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm a, the co-founder of a national cycling education program that was founded right in Orlando, Florida, called Cycling Savvy, um, where we teach traffic skills but we teach them in a unique way, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, what I want to start with is, is we're here to talk about safety. I want to talk about setting safety into a larger vision. First of all, in a livable community, as a, as a person who uses a bicycle for my primary mode of transportation, I view a livable community as a place that supports me as a bicyclist, and I'm expected on the road, I'm respected on the road, and I'm considered normal. Um, in the transportation mix. 
Now, to achieve that on a broader scale in our culture, we have to rediscover some lost truths because uh, along the way, we have adopted some beliefs that are not really supportive of respecting bicyclists as part of transportation. One is that streets are for people. They always have been and they still are, but many people don't understand it that way. Um, bicyclists have the same rights and responsibilities as drivers. That's another thing that a lot of people don't understand. On both sides, the bicyclists also don't understand this. Um, bicycling is inherently safe. <laughs> And this seems like an odd thing to say when we're talking about how dangerous bicycling is here in Florida. But bicycling safety, and all safety, is a product of behavior. And when we recognize that, and then we recognize the assets that bicycling gives us, the fact that we travel at the speed of human perception, we can react to things very easily. The fact that we have 360 degree perception, we can hear, we can see, we don't have blind spots. Um, this actually makes bicycling incredibly safe. The problem that we have is bicyclist behavior. And we, when we look at the actual crash causes and the statistics, what we have is we can identify the behaviors that led to the crashes. And, and the problem here is that we don't have just a lack of information in, the, in, in our culture. What we have is a complete inversion of information in our culture. We have people that believe things are safe that just are the opposite of what's safe. And so as a result, we view behaviors that increase risk as being safe, hugging the edge of the road. This guy's so close to those parked cars, if he was any closer, he'd be inside them. <laughs> um, that is not a safe way to ride. And at the same time, we, re we view behaviors that mitigate risk, taking your place out in the queue of traffic as being unsafe, and that's because they're not normal. They're not seen every day, and so we think they're unsafe. And even worse, we've, many people believe they're rude. And this is a huge inhibitor of safe behavior. So how do we get here? You know, how do we get so upside down? Well, I'm sure most of you saw uh, Peter Norton. Um, I've read his book. I wasn't here for the presentation. Um, but somewhere between here and here, we lost our way. And and, and Peter would have talked about the great reframing, how we reframed safety from unsafe being, ve speeding vehicles being viewed as unsafe to people in the street being viewed as unsafe. And what came with that was a propaganda campaign that's lasted generations. We've had 90 years of get out of the street or we'll kill you. <laughs> the message in this children's coloring book is streets are for cars, and the street is dangerous at all times. Now, is that mythology or what? I mean, the street is not dangerous. The street is just pavement. <laughs> and here's a, a bicycling safety booklet in which the message is don't take chances. And there's not a single crash countermeasure in this book. This book is all about don't do this or this bad thing will happen. And there's not anything to tell you what you should do. So here's an example from the book. The bicyclist hits a pothole, crashes, and the motorist can't stop in time and runs him over. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not how I understand do care. <laughs> so now we have transposed this set of beliefs upon the truths. That streets are for cars. It's not true, but we believe that. That people have to stay out of the way or they'll get killed. It's not true, but we believe that. And that there's a right of speed now that governs the roadway. And if you can't keep up, you can't be on the road. And that's not true either. So the problem with these bad beliefs is that bad beliefs are the driving factor in unsuccessful behavior, crash-causing behavior. And bicycling seems dangerous because of the predominance of unsuccessful behavior. So if I believe that streets are for cars, then the rules are for cars too, and I don't have to stop at stop signs and red lights. And we see a lot of that, and I'm, there are a lot of bicyclists who honestly believe that. Um, if the system doesn't support me, I'll just do whatever. I operate outside the system. I'm not a pedestrian, I'm not a driver, and so I'll just, you know, go wherever I want. People who operate on the edges in pedestrian space with their bicyclists become reactive because they're constantly they're constantly suffering conflicts because they're irrelevant. And so they're always in the path of turning drivers. 
But the other side of that is that they're unpredictable too. So for the driver has an experience with this as well, and that, and that colors the motorist perception of how safe bicycling is. Bicyclists, because they've been told to, to stay out of the street, they hug the edges. The problem with hugging the edges is it makes you irrelevant. And it is the, the primary factor in over 90% of all motorist at fault crashes is that the bicyclist was irrelevant and the motorist made a mistake. The, here's a, another example. I call this the inferiority priority complex. This is bicyclists that hug the edge and then when they come to a queue of cars, they scoot down the sidewalk. Now these guys can't even, they can't even ride down. There's so little room in the lane. So they're scootering down with one foot unclipped down the curb. <laughs> but what happens is they get to the front of the line they passed all of these cars that had already passed them. And all those cars are heading for the interstate. And so as you can see, the group of, this is a group of, that we're leading for the mayor's ride. We are on the road all by ourselves because nobody wants the lane that we're in. Everybody wants the lane that those two are in and nobody can pass them. <laughs> and they butted right to the front of the line and now they're holding up an entire line of cars uh, that are getting on the, the highway. So that's a little disruptive. Um, then the other thing they do is they invade, invade pedestrian space. And this, in a downtown, this is, this is my pet peeve. I don't want people riding past my table while I'm eating. <laughs> and, and so in, in downtown Orlando, this is a problem. I've been almost hit by, by, by bicyclists many times on the sidewalk as a pedestrian. And then there is, you know, I must face the enemy because if I turn my back on him, he will kill me. <laughs> this guy has a completely inverted set of uh, crash cause and effect in, in his brain. So the problem here is the inhibiting beliefs that these people take out on the road. First of all, they don't believe that they're legitimate and they don't believe that they belong there. They think they're at the mercy of other people. They have absolutely no control over their safety because they operate in such a way that they can't react to anything except to slam on the brakes. They think that motorists are careless and mean because they're operating in a way that puts them in constant conflict. And this is really important. When you want to promote bicycling in your community, these are the stories these people tell. This, this is the story you will hear from them. This is the story that infects every person in their life. And this is not a way to promote bicycling. This does not say, oh, I think, I think I'll go do that too. You know, that looks like fun. So now we, we take the bad beliefs and we overlay some bike lanes. Um, so we want to make people feel safe. Um, what could possibly go wrong there? He might spill his coffee. Um, we want to attract bicyclists, but then in this case, this is a bike lane that is to the right of a right turn only lane. Um, that is what we would call an attractive nuisance. Uh, here, now, we're, now we've got mandates, okay? So you have to accommodate bicyclists and pedestrians. So, um, oh, well, we'll just stripe a bike lane right there through that interchange. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to ride there. And, and then, of course, there's the belief that um, this guy is suddenly going to ride in the right direction because we gave him a bike lane. Well, you just gave that guy exactly what he wanted because the only thing he was afraid of was being hit head on. <laughs> And they also don't get bicyclists off the sidewalk. So one of the problems with urban bike lanes in particular is that when you channelize traffic by vehicle type in a very complex environment, what you're doing is you are putting people in this horrible conflict zone. There's constant turning movements, cars entering the roadway, cars leaving the roadway. Uh, buses pulling over for bus stops, car doors opening. There's all these things that are happening on the edge. The edge is a very tumultuous and dangerous place. And it's really the last place that anybody should ride a bicycle in an urban environment. And so when, when you stripe that place off and tell the bicyclist to ride there, you're creating bad experiences, really. And you're not promoting safe behavior because safe behavior is, is actually not to ride in that area. And what, what happens is when the infrastructure is then not correcting behavior and sometimes making it worse, we've got this, these dysfunctional beliefs, we have infrastructure overlaid on it, we have poor bicyclist behavior, and we create a sense of entitlement because, of course, you belong there um, and not here in my space. 
And, and what we've done is we've create, we create a retributive cycle. So we're not actually solving the social problem. The problem that we have with the traditional approach that we've taken to cycling safety and promoting cycling is that we've taken this needs-based approach where we create an external input to meet a need. Well, think about the need that we're meeting. Um, if you're meeting the need of a person who doesn't know where they should be riding and they think they should be on the edge of the road, of course they think they want more space on the edge of the road because they don't recognize all the other conflicts. So if we don't understand the root causes of those needs and the root causes of the behavior, then we're going to have a hard time actually solving the core problem that drives the behavior. And another thing that we've done for a very long time is we have failed to recognize and, and, and embrace successful behaviors because successful behaviors is where we're going to find the answer. So I want to show you successful behaviors because Successful cyclists are really, that's where the key is. That's where we're going to find our answer. What successful cyclists are in, in terms of change agent terminology is they are positive deviants. What a positive deviant is, is this somebody who is practicing uncommon behaviors that are different from everyone else. And those behaviors are vital behaviors because those behaviors are the reason that they are being successful where others are struggling. And the key in this is that, that these people within the community have access to the same resources, they face the same challenges. Okay, so we find, we find the vital behaviors for an American cyclist in an American city. We don't find the vital behaviors for an American cyclist in Copenhagen. I want to tell you a little story of how um, I became a positive deviant. I, I had uh, been bicycling when I moved to Orlando in the late 19, mid 1980s. I began bicycling in earnest, and I bicycled for many years, um, some for transportation, commuting, some for um, just recreation. I explored the city on a bicycle. About 10 years ago, I rented office space on Edgewater Drive in College Park. And some of you may be familiar with Edgewater. It was a recipient of a complete streets treatment in 2001. And when I, when I located my office there, I was experiencing different conditions than I had ridden in when I, when I started to commute. It was a 10-mile commute. And what happened was the traditional behaviors um, that I was practicing, which are what everybody else does, were not working for me. I was experiencing a lot of conflicts, and in particular, on Edgewater Drive, I was experiencing the majority of my conflicts. And this, this road has a bike lane on it. And um, I, within the first year that I was commuting, I got hit by a car. And that didn't change the fact that I was, you know, it didn't change my behavior that much except that I became vigilant. So I started riding slower. I white knuckled it up the bike lane. Um, but every, every trip, I had some stupid motorist story because I had conflicts all the time. And, and I remember the, the, the day that finally did it for me, I was riding home from work. I'm, I'm heading up past, I just left my office, I'm heading past the post office. A woman in a car darts out across my path. I have to hit my brakes. She flies up to the end of the queue and, and stops. And I, I continue riding up the bike lane. When I get to her position, she suddenly veers into the bike lane because she's tired of sitting in traffic. And, and she didn't even look. And so I, again, I, ha I, I had an air horn. I blasted the air horn at her. I swerved around her. Um, I continued riding. I was a little rattled at that point. Two blocks later, I'm, I'm driving, riding about the speed of traffic because I didn't know that if I was going the speed of traffic, I should get out of the bike lane. And um, I approached the next intersection, and a car began to cut across my path to make a right turn. So I, you know, I screamed at the driver and I, and I swerved around him and, and I continued down. And the, the next uh, red light, I stopped at the red light. And I'm, at this point, I'm, just, I'm rattled <laughs> because, because I've just, you know, in 10 seconds had two people try to kill me. And so I, I, I look at the car next to me and I suddenly feel completely vulnerable. The guy has his window rolled down and I, and I look inside the window. I go, you're not going to turn right here, are you? Because <laughs> I was just sure that that was coming next, but he wasn't. I continued on my way home 
And, and at that point, I had to solve this problem. So I got on the internet, you know, like everyone does, and I started Googling magic paint because I was sure that there was some color we could paint that bike lane that would make the motorist notice me in it. <laughs> and, um, and, and my research actually led me to, I read a lot of studies about that. I read a lot of studies about bike lanes and critiques of studies. And my research led me to this odd group of, shall we say, grumpy old men who, um, were claiming that they didn't have any problems on the roads. And I thought they were full of BS. And when they started explaining why they weren't having any problems, I was sure they were full of BS because I knew that wasn't going to work in Orlando. But I, I decided I would try it. And so I started to try the behaviors that they were espousing. And, you know, I went out into a more assertive position. I left the bike lane and I waited you know, for, for something horrible to happen because I was sure I was going to be punished. And lo and behold, shockingly, they were right. Nothing bad happened. In fact, nothing bad happened. Nothing bad has happened. <laughs> and and w what ended up happening was my, the entire character of my riding changed. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a city full of smart motorists. All those people that were stupid before, they suddenly got a whole lot smarter. And my cycling got a whole lot easier, and the conflicts went away. And... And it, it was, the, the world changed. It was like being transported into some alternative universe. It was very, very strange. And so what that did for me was it returned bicycling to me. The joy and freedom of bicycling had become overridden by the frustration and bitterness that I, that I had formed over these years of dealing with the conflicts. And so I decided that I was going to begin to look at what creates the, what these how these behaviors work and how I could articulate them and how I could teach them to other people so that they would have this experience. So the first thing that, bi that successful bicyclists do is they recognize crash causes and countermeasures. They avoid the common mistakes that bicyclists make and they avoid the mistakes that motorists make. They're part of the system. Uh, they, don't, they don't go down the queue. They, they wait in line. They stop at red lights. They follow the rules. They recognize patterns, and this is really, really important, um, and something that we teach in Cycling Savvy as a, as a barrier removal to people who really don't want to ride on busy roads, but sometimes you have to to connect the quiet streets. If, if I exploit the traffic light signals, I can get a really nasty, busy, this is Colonial Drive in Orlando, I can get a really nasty commercial arterial to myself for about a minute and a half which is usually enough time to get from where I've come out to my destination or to the next network of quiet streets. It's amazing. They understand, there's Dwayne. <laughs> they understand traffic flow. Um, by understanding how traffic flows around diverges and, and converges and, and, all, kind, and all these different tra um, road features, you can position yourself for minimal conflict to make things very, very easy. And you can't, you can't build a bike lane to do this. In fact, that, that is that bike lane <laughs> from the other picture. It's, it jumps right there. And the other thing they do is they plan ahead. Um, instead of muscling your way through traffic when you're 200 feet from the intersection, traffic travels in platoons. When there's a gap between platoons and you're a thousand feet from the intersection, go into the lane that you want and just use that lane. When the next platoon reaches you, they will flow naturally around you. <coughs> Successful bicyclists communicate. Most bicyclists do not communicate. Most bicyclists just, you know, I don't belong here. I'm not going to talk to anybody. So um, the important thing about communication is it establishes you as a human. And it confirms that things work because when you communicate, motorists try to help you out. All, almost all motorists will try to help you out when you communicate. And then the other part of communication is reward. We always reward drivers for, for helping us out because not only is it a nice human thing to do, that's advocacy. Because when you make somebody feel good about themselves, they feel good about you, they feel good about bicyclists. And um, first, of course, we avoid the edges. Um, a vital behavior for, for bicycling in a, in a dense downtown urban area with lots of conflicts is to ride in the left tire track. We stay out in the lane of traffic. 
So the reason we're able to do this is that we have empowering beliefs. We believe we belong there. We believe we have every right to be there. We believe that we have control over our own safety, and that's incredibly empowering. We believe that most motorists are courteous and safe because that's our experience. That is my experience. I don't have conflicts, and I rarely experience incivility, and when I do, I don't even remember it 10 seconds later because it's just not a big deal. And this is, this is the key right here, is that I can sell cycling to everybody because I'm completely enthusiastic about it, and I don't have stupid motorist stories anymore. I have really good experiences, and the bicycle is a wonderful way to get around. It's a wonderful way to connect with the community, and I just absolutely love it. And this is the case for most of our students. Our students go out there, and they're just, you know, and, and, and then their friends come, and they take the class because they want to ride to the farmer's market too. So we're, we want to choose a strategy that's going to help us realize our vision. The first thing that we should ask of any strategy, of anything that we're going to build, of anything that we're going to do, is does it support or undermine vital behaviors? Don't build things that undermine vital behaviors. And does it reinforce or inhibit, does it reinforce the inhibiting beliefs or does it promote the empowering beliefs? We want to do things that promote empowering, empowering belief system and we don't want to do things that feed that cultural belief of bicyclists not belonging on the road. So our traditional approach has been focused on getting more people to ride. And so as a result, what we've done is we've focused on what keeps people from riding. Well, they're scared. Yeah, they're scared because they don't know. Um, they don't know how great it is. They don't know how safe it is. They don't know how much control they have. But when we focus on that symptom, and we ignore the root cause and we cater to fear with infrastructure that's just designed to make them feel safe, and then we manufacture conflict on top of that, we start to create cognitive dissonance and we feed that retributive cycle. And we haven't fixed the problem, we haven't fixed the culture. We've just sort of petted the culture. <laughs> nice culture, here. So what I'd like to do is I would like to take us to a higher level goal of creating a culture that supports bicycling because a culture that supports bicycling is going to produce more bicyclists. And so if we address the root causes, and first of all, the root causes are a software problem. So we need software solutions for our software problem. So education, education of bicyclists, education of motorists, education of the public in general. Um, I mean, the one thing we never talk about when we talk about Copenhagen and and in Netherlands is that they educate the heck out of their people. <laughs> um, so promoting civility and community building. We do a lot of community building activities in Orlando and then getting law enforcement support. It's incredibly important to get law enforcement support. And at the same time, we can focus on great progressive infrastructure solutions. Um, there's a lot of things out, there's a lot of infrastructure out there that enhances trip quality without reinforcing bad beliefs and without um, reinforcing bad behaviors. When we do that, we're going to create a virtuous cycle because we're going to eliminate, we're basically going to, we're going to kill that root cause. We're going to root out those bad beliefs. And through doing that, we will create our livable community where we are expected and respected. So the jump start for the virtuous cycle, um, my belief in creating the Cycling Savvy program was that we could jump start the virtuous cycle by focusing on the intersection of self-interest and, and influence potential. And the bicyclist himself is that intersection because, because the bicyclist has a self-interest in having a quality experience and the bicyclist influences the motorists that encounter him. So if it becomes normal to encounter a bicyclist who is operating as a normal vehicle driver, then it becomes normal for bicyclists to be normal vehicle drivers. And, and by virtue of that, you begin to change the cultural beliefs. And the bicyclists affect everybody in their life. So here's how we do it in, in Cycling Savvy. First of all, we've, we, we studied influence strategies and we're using proven influence strategies that have been used in, in many other intractable problems. One is we reframe everything. We reframe the roads, we reframe safety, we reframe the rules, we reframe your role on the road. We engage people. We get a lot of interaction from our students because if, if we engage people, then they're going to take ownership 
of, the, of this new information. We facilitate enactment. It's very important for people to enact new behaviors. And so we've created a, a, a class which facilitates enactment. We build success upon success. This is really important because we're taking people from basic riding all the way through to going through a scary interchange in our class. And we do that by carefully crafting successful experiences because when you build success upon success, you create enthusiasm to try increasingly difficult things. And then we provide social reinforcement because people will change, people will adopt deviant behavior if they feel that they are part of a tribe. So here's how it works. How we empowered Wei. This is Wei. She bought her bike a week before the class. This was our uh, class that I taught in Dallas. And um, she had never ridden a bike with gears. She was scared to ride on a quiet street. And we took her through the most fearsome interchange that we could find in Dallas. Um, so we start out in the classroom, guided discovery, get them to own the information. We, we use a lot of stories and metaphors and things to disrupt the brain, to get to suspend disbelief and shift perspective. We use vicarious modeling. This is very important. We do you use a lot of cyclist view video to show successful behavior and good results because before a person will try something, they have to know, can I do it and will it be worth it? We, we develop the skills that Way needs in order to communicate with motorists on the road. We have a parking lot session that's three hours long where we go from basic balance to emergency handling. And then we hit the road and, skipped one, and we start to build our progression. This is Way on the first feature. A feature is an intersection that we send our students through one at a time. And she's come through the first one. She's like, okay, that worked. Um, I, I think I can do this. Here's the second one. Um, this, this is all right. This is working out. Here's the third one. We, we're now we're starting to up the ante a little bit, and we've got her negotiating with low-speed traffic because it's very easy to negotiate with low-speed traffic. She negotiates beautifully. She's absolutely thrilled with herself. We continue through a couple more features until we get to the ultimate challenge, which is Northwest Highway at the Central Expressway. This is what we send our novices through in Dallas. <laughs> And here comes Wei, a girl who 10 hours before was afraid to ride on a quiet street. And she, here she comes down the hill. She's surrounded by cars. She is cool as a cucumber. She decides which, which one of those drivers she wants to negotiate with to get into that right lane. She does her negotiation. She slides in. She gives the driver a friendly wave, which I didn't quite catch on my camera. And here she comes, and she is absolutely tickled with herself. And when she, she went and looped around, and then the, the students were, were looping around and then going across the road. And when she queued up on the other side, I turned around, and she goes like this. <laughs> she, was, she was absolutely thrilled. And, and, and every one of these people had that shared experience with her. And this is really important. The shared experience creates community um, because that it, it's powerful. It solidifies that new behavior. And so this is Wei, and this was Wei coming around the corner on her very last feature. That's an absolutely natural expression. She was so thrilled. But Wei has new beliefs now, and, and her new beliefs give her access to everywhere. She can go anywhere she wants. She doesn't need a facility to get there. Of course, there are lots of facilities that would be nice to have, but she doesn't need one. And she is now the jump starter of the virtuous cycle because she believes that bicycling is safe and easy and enjoyable and she believes that, that other drivers are courteous. And so she's got a very positive and empowering message to share with the world. And now upon the solid foundation, we want to support Wei. We want to support her in the new behaviors that she's learned. And we'll need, there's, there's, we need law reform. We need to work with law enforcement to support these behaviors. We need we need social marketing to, to share the broader message. We need driver's ed. We need community building activities. And I don't have enough time to go into all of those, but I want to talk a little bit about progressive facilities because I want to talk about the facilities that support um, what we're doing. So first of all, our cities are full of the most wonderful bicycling asset there is, and that is the quiet street. We have thousands of miles of them. And so these, are, these streets are sometimes even preferable to multi-use trails because they're less crowded and they have more predictable behavior on them. So 
Why don't we show people how to use these streets to get to the destinations they want to get to? Wayfinding is huge. It's, it's inexpensive. It maximizes an asset that we already have. We can further maximize that asset by creating connectivity between those networks of streets. This particular trail is one that allows me to ride north through town connecting one set of low volume roads with another set of low volume roads and avoid a U.S. highway. In a car, I have to use the U.S. highway. So these kind of things, connecting cul-de-sacs, sometimes it's just a matter of knocking down a wall somewhere. Um, these are low cost solutions to connect places that people prefer to ride. Um, here's one from Boulder. Cre creating access on one-way streets. If we decide that we want to keep one-way streets, then creating access for bicyclists on one-way streets gives them the ability to get to destinations without having to go all the way around the block or ride on the sidewalk, which is usually what they do. Um, they have to be signalized properly. They don't necessarily make good through routes because the, the signal timing favors the, the traffic direction. But you know, if you put sharrows in the, in going with traffic and you put in a contraflow lane going against traffic, it increases access. Um, equality is, is very important. There's a lot of tools out there now with the bikes may use full lane signs. Again, we're using assets we already have with sharrows. Um, you remember, recognize that green area there from the vital behaviors diagram. Um, this is what they did in Long Beach. Uh, that's, they painted vital behavior right there on the ground. <laughs> um, sometimes it is appropriate to cre create extra space on the edge of the road for bicyclists. If I'm climbing a long steep hill, I would prefer to have some space in which to do it. I don't necessarily always need the stripe there because the stripe sometimes creates a situation where the, that area gathers debris if it's not swept. But stripe or not, that, that pavement is useful. Now on the other side, you can see that there's a shower on the downside, downhill side. You don't ever want to put a bike lane on the downhill because you don't want people going 30 miles an hour in a bike lane. And then if we start to rethink our, our arterial roads where we have all these extra lanes, um, we can, we can think about it in terms of the bike, bus, and right turn only where you've provided a lane that only the, the buses and the bicyclists can use except for when motorists need to make right turns. I also would think of it in terms of just expect bikes in the right lane. It doesn't necessarily have to be exclusive, but why don't we change the expectation? You know, we, what we've done all over the place here in Florida is we've built these horrible, as <laughs> Eric already talked about, these horrible four-foot bike lanes on the edge of these arterial roads, and they're full of debris, and you're being, you've got trucks zooming past you. Um, I would much rather have 10 feet than 4 feet, or 11 feet than 4 feet. So um, when, we, when we start thinking about uh, repurposing some of this overbuilt suburban infrastructure, maybe that's something we could do with it. And then trails, um, progressive trails on their, uh, on their own right of way. This is the Katy Way Trail. It's a wonderful corridor trail. It takes people from, from the bedroom communities in the northeast side of town all the way into downtown. These are great where you can build them, but they cost a million dollars a mile. So um, you need the right of way and, um, and the will to do it. But I, I love that trail. I use it all the time. And then the other thing we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about facilities is we need to have the versatility. Uh, I drive a cargo bike, much like the one in that photo. Um, I also pull trailer often. Those vehicles are wider. Uh, they're wider than some bike lanes. And um, you put a vehicle like that on a narrow cycle track with two-way traffic, and you're going, to have, you're going to have issues with space. Um, the low, the low-slung vehicles, these, the trikes, I've had, I've had trikes now in two of my classes. Um, these are great transportation vehicles, and they're, they're perfectly safe to operate on the roadway. And I don't know anybody who wants to operate one in a bike lane. It's terrifying to be down that low and shoved off to the side because your, your sight lines are bad, and, and you, you just don't have the visibility when you don't have that cushion of space around you. And then the other thing we need to think about is we've got now this whole industry of electric assist and electric bicycles coming out. And again, these things are now capable. A person with, with no athleticism whatsoever can ride 20 miles an hour on one of these things. And 20 miles an hour is way too fast for, for most of the bicycle-specific infrastructure. You don't want to do that in a bike lane. You don't want to do that on a cycle track. And, and then expandability is the other issue. 
um, let's, let's think about the fact that if we are going to increase the number of people out there, um, we want to have facilities that are expandable, that are big enough for everybody to use. And, and also, this is really important, when I'm, when I'm going with my partner to dinner or to the grocery store or something, I want to ride side by side. I want to have a conversation. I don't want to be forced single file into a narrow space. So I always choose routes on which I can ride side by side with somebody, either four lane roads or residential roads or, or, or whatever. So when we bring it all together, this is, this is my vision for for the cyclist friendly community. We have a cultural respect as a foundation. We have successful bicyclists, courteous motorists, and on top of that we have this wonderful progressive infrastructure that makes our life, our, our, qual our cycling a higher quality. And the way we, want it, we do that is by um, addressing successful behaviors for bicyclists and creating successful bicyclists. So. I want to start, that was fantastic, thank you so much. I want to start by underlining something that I think is really profoundly, profoundly important about that presentation. It's wonderful if you can live in Portland, but most of us don't. What Carrie's doing is taking Orlando, places like Orlando, which are one, the most dangerous, statistically, places for pedestrians and cyclists. They don't have the facilities, and she's making them safe. Right? And she's making them safe by targeting the user. And that's how we start reclaiming these spaces. When you generate the ridership, you get the demand for the infrastructure. And it's that key thing. How do we take what we have? Not the dream world, where we all live in Portlandia and we have, you know. How do we take the real world we have and begin to reclaim it back? And it's, it's so incredible. We've got to get you actually down to Fort Lauderdale to train, train our people down there. It's so profoundly important. That, Right there is how we crystallize and build and reclaim our street. We've got to start somewhere, and we've got to start with not what we wish we had, but what we actually have. And that's just really fantastic. Uh, thanks. And questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so this is for Carrie. So you did this independent of your partner's um, initiative, and then you Uh, yes, I, um, Mike Wilson, who is uh, our Metro Plan Smart Growth Planner, and I were both cycling instructors under another program, and we were, we were dissatisfied at the results that we were getting from the other program. And I had a bunch of ideas, and, and Mike and I kind of, we share a brain on that sort of thing. And so we just put our heads together and decided that, hey, let's, um, let's come up with something that meets all the needs that we want to have, and so we did it. There wasn't any funding. It just. You didn't need uh, any authorization from the no. police? No. We had no funding and no permission. <laughs> <laughs> we just did it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he created the first Yeah, he taught first the class like back at Foothill College. The first time he taught it was like back in 1975, 1976 or something. Yeah. So it actually, when you mentioned that, you reminded me of what yeah. uh, it, him. Effective cycling was a 30-hour course. And is that, <coughs> so is, would you say there's some elements of what you have? There are some. There, it's, it's an evolution. We do, uh, there are a lot of techniques that we teach that we're not in effective cycling, mm -hmm. um, and there, there are ways in which we've taken um, 
that original content to the next level, uh, our framing is completely different, and our methodologies are completely different. And was the, the, the course that you felt a little bit, you know, like not satisfied with, and I think you mentioned Mike Wilson, that you were both teaching this course, was that the lead of certified yeah. instructors? Yeah, that was the lead course. Yeah. Okay. Marcy? Can I speak to that? Sure. Um, I am one of those cyclists who doesn't get their adrenaline up. I enjoy every minute of my ride everywhere I go. I do not, I do not have that experience. Um, I think that there was an element of John Forrester's original program and his um, original attitude that led people to believe that that's what bicy bicycling on the road was about. But I, I drive a cargo bike. Um, I wear regular clothes. I, I drive with exactly the same kind of effort on a four-lane road with traffic on it as I do on a residential street. There, I, I don't have that experience of white knuckle riding um, and neither do my students. We teach people strategies for maximizing the road. I think, I think there's a lot of mythology around this belief that in order to ride on the road and not have a facility that you have to ride like that because you don't. And 90% and of my riding is actually done on quiet streets. I don't, I don't typically choose a busy street um, to get where I'm going. The difference is that 90% of my destinations can be accessed with quiet streets, but the 10% difference is that I have to go through some busy interchange or some busy intersection. And I do that with absolute grace and style and as a casual rider, and I don't break a sweat. And, and I'm not, you know, it's, it's just not a white knuckle experience. It's very, very simple. And I don't need a facility to do that, and a facility wouldn't help me in most of those places. Can I just follow up one thing real quick? Because this, this is always interesting with the bike folks, because this is an ongoing debate within the community. And I want to, one thing that I wanted to underline with this, too, is that, and this will make everybody unhappy. Um, but programs like Cycling Savvy, I, here's how I see them, is sort of that here's where we start. Here's where we start building that base of users and that base of demand that can lead to things like the fantastic gold-plated infrastructure that you get in places like Portland or that you get in Europe. But you've got to start somewhere. I mean, you've got to build that body of users and you've got to keep them alive. Um, when people start dying on the street, you undermine the ability to get to that level. And so this is, in some sense, I view as the way to really start tackling the problems of sprawl build the users, and then you can start rethinking fundamentally the type of infrastructure that you want. And I think we're going to a place where the automobile infrastructure is becoming an increasingly insignificant portion of the type of travel we do. We can't support that. But how do we get there with what we have? And programs like Cy Cycling Savvy allow us to do that. I mean, they provide that critical link. And Duane, yeah. Okay. There's been a lot of effort to try to, to do that. I've had more people tell me that riding down the road and I'll have a close encounter with somebody and I'm in, at the right of way, they'll tell me I belong on the, on the sidewalk. And they'll be very self-righteous about it. 
I think it has to do with maybe they consider themselves paying taxes to that road, and we don't. That's the attitude. But as drivers begin to, as you develop a body of cyclists, and this is one of the great things that came out of Wes's presentation, as you develop that body of cyclists, the, the expectancies of the motorists change. And they become more familiar with cyclists use the road, and here are the behaviors that are expected of me. It's when the, and Kerry brought this up, I thought, as well. Is, is bicyclists are viewed as an anomaly, that sort of thinking prevails. But eventually, when you build a mass of users, the culture itself shifts, and the expectancies of both motorists and cyclist shifts. And that's sort of the key, the key thing to get to. I don't think you can touch that one. And you can be on the road in 20 seconds, and you don't know what the rules are necessarily if somebody tells you. There's kind of a fundamental expectation that we can use the road by human power without, without a license. Um, it would, I think that ultimately if we did more to promote the idea that education is a good idea, then you can learn a lot and you can be safer by it. I think that, that that's a, f a good first step is to start, because we're not, we're not promoting the idea that you can get bicycle education. People, people don't think they need it. Um, they don't know it's available. They don't think they want it. But the people who take it will tell you that it changed their life. If I could just address that. Uh, the, the, the driver's license is not permission to use the road. It's permission to operate a, a moving deadly object really what this license when you do is saying that you know how to operate this vehicle safely because it, that's this vehicle to be a danger to other people because of the way it is. That's that's the whole the point of the driver license. And from that perspective, the bicycle really doesn't qualify as you know, the same type of vehicle. It's the same thing you need to have a chauffeur's license or something like that. Uh, do you want to? Yeah. OK. I think we're a couple people over there. Uh, here, you're the first one I saw. Um, it, 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 um, there is an initiative in Florida um, through the Florida Bicycle Association where we have actually a panel of law enforcement officers that are helping us develop a roll call type training program. But within an individual departments, building relationships with officers within the department. I, I had a very good relationship with the now retired training officer in Orlando. Um, and that was very, very helpful because when there was an issue, I could always go to him. And, and he did, a, he was a bicyclist as well and had done a, a terrific job of training at least 60% of OPD officers in, you know, they, they, he trained them in the bike law enforcement program, but he, he did spend a lot of time talking about bicyclist rights on the road and so forth. I, I could address that too. We recently went through this with a bicycle plan that we did in Texas. And um, what we, what we found, or what we found is that the, the, the laws governing bicycling are, are fairly consistent from state to state. Some cities have particular things that are, that are different. But um, in this situation, we had a police chief tell us uh, something that was just patently not true about bicycling. He said that it was illegal for a cyclist to ride more than 18 inches from the curb. Um, <laughs> that was not, not legal in Texas. Um, Imaginary law. We knew that it was, but I, I learned some time ago while in a traffic ticket that you don't argue with policemen so um, we didn't argue with them. What we did is we came back and we said, um, uh, "Could you? We want to make sure we include all the information in our in our plan that's relevant to bicycling. Can you provide us the citation for that so that we can make sure we get get the reference right?" And he went back and said, "You know, that actually wasn't even in there. I must have heard that at a conference or something." So it wasn't really. It turned out it really wasn't an issue. So uh, that was part of just kind of raising their awareness. And but uh, you should know as you go into it that the laws are pretty much the same everywhere. Yes. This is one of the more strange presentations on cycling that I've seen. And Terry, I respect your focus on education because that's really critical. You know, in those scenarios on the bike, you really should be thinking about your positioning, staying away from the curves, the cars, et cetera. So that part is really important. But it's really strange to see what you're talking about through your cycling methods and the context in which you're applying it. Um, 
infrastructure and the difference in Orlando is the kind of facilities that you're showing are designs that were done you know, 10, 15 years ago. There's so much more that's evolved, especially in the last five years, that would be applied to the context of Orlando in you know, conjunction with education, concerns of enforcement, et cetera. Uh, you know, equity is not to mention, it's actually one of the leading reasons why we go where we put these facilities. Um, and so I'm very kind of interested to see what Wes, you would say, or what Wes is saying in terms of the difference between Portland where we've got some of the education and that element is part of it. But in Orlando, we, we're doing the education bit, and I don't see how to really retrofit a condition that's really, really intimidating for most people to write off. Well, you can I start real quick? Yeah. Uh, first thing I want to say is you really don't underestimate the infrastructure. It's a big part of it. And it's important to educate people like she's talking about and get them to be able to bike safely in places like Orlando. But bicycling will never become more than a fringe activity if we don't do things like they're doing in these great places. We'll never get kids to bike in the road like that. They can't. Which is why it's confusing. Right. So we need to educate people to bike in these places and get that body of users there to start beginning the change in infrastructure. Then we can build bicycling into something that's more than just for people that are enthused and confident in those higher levels of that Portland you know, hierarchy of bikers. We want to get it to be more than that. And that's where we need to combine these things. Boulder and Davis and Portland and New York ride their cycle weren't always the way to yeah. right. it's, it's a long, it's a 30, you're looking at the history of Boulder and Davis and Portland, it's 20, 30 years in the making. Well, yeah. You start with the fringe user, though. You've got a dedicated base there, and if you can get them to survive, you can get them to demand. And when you get them to demand, the facilities follow. At all, you start with the most vulnerable. Well, first of all, um, there's a, a large difference in culture between um, Portland and Boulder and Orlando. Uh, there's also a large difference in climate. Uh, between Portland and Boulder and Orlando. And I think to assume that you can just build something and all of a sudden create mode share in Orlando where um, it's, you know, at this time of year, we're getting into the time of year where I start to use my car. Because if I have to go to a meeting um, and it's a 15 minute bike ride, I'm gonna have to spend 15 minutes drying off and cleaning up in a public restroom and changing my clothes for a 15 minute meeting. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn around and go, back home. So, so there's a lot of other inhibiting factors to, to bicycling that you're not going to have some magical production of mode share just because you, you built a shiny object. Um, and, and the other thing is I look at Orlando and I look at the infrastructure that we have and, and there's a lot, we have some, some great connector trails and things that, that make cycling very, very easy and I'm looking at the infrastructure that I have, the infrastructure that I'm using and the trips that I'm making and I am making trips on roads and facilities that children can ride on. A lot of my trips are, are on roads and facilities that children can ride on. And the places that I'm connecting through these busy interchanges, there aren't really infrastructure solutions that you can build for them. You can't, you can't take people through some of these busy intersections and interchanges with a facility. You know, because you're going to end up with some Frankenstein's monster of a thing. You know, or, or, I mean, obviously it'd be great if we could just build, you know, flyovers and tunnels and, and things like that. And we have that. We have 90 miles of trail in Orlando. Um, I don't disagree with that at all, but, you know, uh, I guess part of the bigger problem why we're all here in the Mergen's conference is that you're talking about Orlando itself is, yeah, you can't retrofit a lot of those intersections because they're so massively screwed up to begin with. You know, there's a reason why in the top four cities in Florida, number one most dangerous city, your summer report is Orlando. For pedestrians. I don't see how you, if you're talking about, you mentioned retrofitting um, the city to get cycling started, you can't just do that with an education. That, and I agree, it's not just for just rider, it's a whole period of things. I don't know about like. It's, it's not just the infrastructure yeah. on a particular and, road, too. Right, it's and the we're land not just doing education either. We're the doing street, street networks and right. the fact that you have to drive further distances. So it all has to come together. One at a time. Actually, Marcy is ready to, real quick. Go ahead. <laughs> Actually, and we, we have to dry off from the rain in Portland. 
Yeah. What we spend on our world-class gold-plated infrastructure is so small, it's embarrassing. But the challenge, I think, with, with suburbia is how do we get the demand for that? Elected officials aren't going to respond to, I mean, we've got a lot of demands on elected officials, and it's, you know, they would be very nice, but what we hear time after time in cities here is we've got to move the traffic. And it's not, the demand isn't high enough and the voice isn't loud enough for them to really respond to it, so how do we get... I mean, even in Portland, it didn't start with suddenly you had bike boulevards. These are relatively new. I mean, it started with 20, 30 years ago, the culture of cycling started building up. And you had critical mass rides going out and confronting. I mean, from what I understand, the critical mass folks there were just at odds with that the police as bad as anywhere, if not worse than anywhere else in the country. Yeah, but but it, so there was a vision, too. Mass. But the leadership follows in part the, the demand generated from the populace. And when people are running scared, that it's hard to get that demand there. Yeah. I have the gentleman in the blue shirt. Okay. I think that in, in su suburban and, and urban are two different contexts, and, and I don't want to mix them too much because this, the, the problems, a lot of the stuff that's being built and a lot of the things that, that we're focusing on are in an urban environment where it's already easy to cycle, and the, the problem is just the perception. People mm -hmm. don't realize what the assets are already. In the suburban environment, it's really not, it's, it's easy enough for me to ride down University Boulevard, for example, which is a, a six-lane arterial, and control the lane, and I can do it completely safely. And I'll hear some territorial noises from my fellow road users, and I just ignore them. Um, but it's not very pleasant. It's loud, um, and, and the incivility you know, bothers uh, a lot of people. Um, adding a bike lane that's five feet wide to a road like that makes it worse because then you get shoved into a space that's barely wider than your body with absolutely zero passing buffer built into it, which means that the cars in the adjacent lane are closer to you than, when you're, than if you were out controlling a regular 11-foot lane. Um, now, I, in, in Irvine, I rode in 8-foot bike lanes because their standard out there is to build an 8-foot bike lane on arterial roads. And that was fine. That, bothered, that didn't bother me. The other thing was that, that they were dashed 200 feet from the intersection, so you know, it was, it was easy to get out of it well ahead of time. And because the bike lane was eight feet wide, the motorists actually merged into it before they made a right turn because it was the width of their car. So, um, I th but I think that we have to think about, when we start thinking about that suburban context and we start thinking about eight foot bike lanes, then we need to start thinking about our use of impervious surfaces and <laughs> asphalt and well, just, that sort of thing. I, I, that was interesting because I, I ride in Chicago Yeah, on a two-lane road, it's definitely you would you want a little bit more space.
bike boulevards or yeah. I think it was mm. Seaside actually marketed them as up the start, wasn't it? I thought they called them like jogging paths or bike lanes or something. Mm -hmm. I heard that that was how like Seaside was initially sold to people because they thought the idea of an alley was bad. But I don't know about actual use. Well, well, the, the first response <coughs> that I brought to this in our community, the bikers didn't respond very positively. They 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 thought of it as ugly. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, it, it, it comes back to a matter of design speed as well. If you figure a cyclist is going to travel at 10 or 15 miles an hour, how fast were you, are you actually supposed to drive in an alley? Usually it's, it's more like 5 or 10 miles an hour, so it's, it's a low speed environment. People put their trash out there, they put their brush out there, whatever it is that's being picked up in the alley, it's, it's a service area. So you're really telling the cyclist, don't be on the main road, come in through the back door where the service come in so that nobody can see you. Well, a lot of alleys also have garages there, so you're going to have people backing their cars up into alleys, so it depends on the city. Yeah. Right, the connections would make it tough too, connecting from an alley to another alley, um, it'd be hard to do that. This gentleman didn't use that. infrastructure? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Well, I mean, some of the best bicycling cities are like Minneapolis. Minneapolis yeah. Is, a lot of those places do get used. Madison, right. Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, so. some of it's perception. so that when I arrive at my destination, I'm dry. <laughs> With hot rain, I would be wet anyway. In Denver, I mean, I... Well, I, I actually think that these things change, and again, this is the point of culture. These things change over time, and you find the critical points that you can get. I mean, you can find in Minneapolis people bicycling in February. I mean, as the population grows, the expectancies change. People learn the solutions for adapting to that, and you can get the gear to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, a lot of it is really, I mean, with this cultural stuff, we're not talking about instant solutions. We're talking about time. I mean, ultimately, these are things that we have to incubate and grow. And the cities that are most successful are the ones that have been most successful about nurturing that culture. And once the culture expands, you can, I mean, so you've got a lot of casual cyclists in Portland. How do you prove you're a hardcore cyclist? Well, the people I know in the Northwest now, they bike up the Cascades, right? Because they have to prove that they're tougher. They're at the frontier. And there's always those people that push the boundaries. But in doing that, they shift the entire cultural expectation forward. There hasn't been any funding for the work that I do. Um, we 
get, we, the, we have student fees that pay our instructors. Um, we recently got a grant, a 402 grant through DOT to be able to spread the class around the state and that'll take effect in October. Um, we, on an individual level in the various communities where we have programs, we have been able to get um, either health departments, health foundations, um, the Metro Plan in Orlando to provide scholarship money that allows us to offer the class to lower income people um, at a discount. And, and so there's been funding for that. They've, they've done that in St. Louis. Uh, they've, they've done it in, um, uh, there's a couple other places that they've done it. What we'll do is uh, we're going to we're going to target various markets around the state, like Miami, Fort Lauderdale, um, and we will tr yeah we'll probably work with the MPOs and and um, what we'll do is is try to attract some people who are interested in in leadership positions within the program, being able to be instructors or whatever, um, as well as the general public. And, and so we have to go in and teach a course, and then we'll have to come back a couple months m later and do an instructor training in order to start to try to start some programs in other cities. We have in, in Florida, we have a program in Jacksonville, Tallahassee. Dwayne's one of our instructors in Tallahassee. Um, we actually have one instructor here in West Palm Beach, but he hasn't, um, he hasn't been able to find a co-instructor, and he hasn't actually uh, been able to find a parking lot to teach the parking lot drill session in. That's actually turned out to be a problem. We have. Um, program in Tamp in St. Petersburg and another one in um, Fort Myers. All right, and I, it's 522, so we've run quite a bit over, 530. <laughs> um, but I want to conclude with just one observation, because I feel like this, the debate comes all the time versus the road cyclist versus the cyclists like a lot of us that are sort of recreational, we're frightened of the arterials. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be an either or, that there's this broad base and we need to target the different segment of users. And the Kerry Caffreys are an enormous asset because it expands the base of people that we can bring into our fold if we want to promote an alternative to the automobile culture. I mean, it's, we can fight over this or that, but I don't think that's the thing. Ultimately, we're talking about expanding the base of cyclist users and tapping into the road cyclist culture is an enormous asset that CNU, I don't think, has done a very good job of, of yet. But they're natural partners for us. Um, and I want to conclude with, with that thought. And hopefully, we, can, we will soon have cycle tracks that I can ride on, which I would love. Anyway, thank you.